You are listening to Living with ADHD and CPTSD, available on Apple Podcasts and other platforms everywhere. Everybody and welcome to another episode of Living with ADHD and CPTSD. Today I am going to talk about emotional regulation when it comes to ADHD. Emotional regulation can be defined as an inability to modulate one's emotional experience and expression, which results in an excessive emotional response. This excessive response is considered inappropriate for the developmental age of the individual and the social settings in which it occurs. These challenges are thought to have the greatest impact on an individual with ADHD's well-being and self-esteem, far more that the core symptoms associated with ADHD, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. Emotional regulation involves five processes. Making efforts to choose situations that minimize your negative emotions and create positive ones, controlling what you can in a given situation, Paying attention to the elements of a situation that make you feel okay, reevaluating situations that upset you, and changing actions that are purely based on negative emotions and may make things worse for you. If you have ADHD, the processes involved in emotional regulation may not occur automatically and you may experience emotional dysregulation. This means not being able to adapt your emotional state to meet your goals. Impulsivity and executive functioning challenges can heighten emotions. Impatience, frustration, and anger may come on quickly, hit with intensity, and last a long time. People with ADHD have the same emotions as other people. What's different is that they often feel these emotions more intensely. These emotions can also last longer and can get in the way of everyday life. Because of that, with ADHD may be overwhelmed, sorry, people with ADHD may be overwhelmed with discouragement, frustration, or anger, give up too quickly on whatever they're doing, and avoid interacting with others. So I, of course, with my ADHD, have experienced a lot of this throughout the time, even before, like long before I even knew that I had ADHD. And the thing that was always frustrating was the fact that I would feel these emotions or and not and not know how to you know deal with it in a way that I could calm down or understand why they're happening or if like if I was in a good situation let's say I actually have a good example um I like to watch football and a lot of times when I'm watching a game, especially like if my team is winning and uh, if it's like the, a big important game, like a playoff game, I can get really excited and feel a, a, like a very happy emotion. But the problem is that I... It, it gets kind of over the top too much, right? Like a, a, a neurotypical person when they're feeling emotion, especially like for uh, their sporting team winning a, an important playoff game, is they can ex- they can feel the emotional uh, uprising or the, the, the happy feeling that they get when they've seen the team that they cheer for win. And then after a certain time period, um, especially if they're at the game, you know, they're, they're happy and they're, they're walking out towards their vehicle or to the bus and they feel a sense of euphoria or, or dopamine in, in the mind, in the brain, and it makes them feel good. And they might cheer and, and be very chatty with their friends and, and maybe a bit of, you know, good sport jeering of their opponent fans. And then by the time they get home, they can feel pretty tired or or feel like it's 
appropriate timing, right? Like it's, they kind of move on to the new, uh, a new thing or they feel normal and they don't have that extreme of happiness uh, as they did when they were at the game. Well, like myself, because of the ADHD, I will have that feeling, but it's more extreme. Like I, I'm not necessarily verbally uh, expressing it to everybody, but I do it in a different way. Like I'm, I get really excited and I can't stop talking about, about the game, the things that happen during the game. Um, I think about it for quite a while, even after I get home, uh, I am, I am thinking about how good it felt. I think about all these different things that are going on about the team, like where they are in the standings, how good a player did. You kind of think about the potential that they could win the big game, you know, the championship game at the end of the year. So, and it's really like the, the level of the happy and excited emotion that I'm feeling seems to be a lot higher. And it isn't like, I, I guess I never really understood at first for the longest time that this was a, not a typical um, experience for other people. And it only took until, like with other events, like uh, something that was good that happened to me or something exciting that I saw or like, experienced in my personal life. It wasn't only, it wasn't until my girlfriend told me that this isn't like normal or neurotypical people tend to experience it and then they move on where I seem to kind of hold on to that emotion or that emotional feeling and I would just stay with it and it would drag on and keep going and keep going. So it was kind of like, that's where the whole, like the come on, like I said earlier, right? The, I'll read it again. The impulsivity and executive function challenges can heighten emotions. So there's the impatience, right? And, but it also just not, it's not just anger and frustration, but it also can be happy feeling like excited, happy, overjoyed emotions. And they come on quickly and there's, it's very intense and it lasts like it, it's a, it's a long lasting kind of feeling. Now it. When I'm when I'm feeling the negative feeling, of course, it's it's the opposite. Instead of the the happy, excited feeling, it's a it's a it's a very sad or angry emotion that I'm feeling. Um, I'm not exactly one that openly expresses it to the certain level that other people do, but with me again, like I, I earlier, is I it holds on for a long time. And I can sit and mull in the in that angry emotion, and it lasts because I have a difficult time, like allowing it to pass. Now the thing that is probably a little different for me than with a lot of people out there is that because of my CPTSD, there's a, it is very likely that also there could be a child part that is triggered and active as well, especially when I'm, when I am feeling angry and I'm, I'm not in a good mood. The, the child part takes over, of course, and it, it, I guess you could say it emphasizes the, that feeling, that emotion. And in order to get, a, get past it, you need to have the ability to unblend from your child part and then start the, like listening and processing with your, with your parts in order to learn and to tr gain that child parts trust so that it's not as obvious or doesn't occur as bad or as, as, as strong in the, in the future. But at the same time, because of the trigger, the ability to, unblend and move on or the the strength and and the length the time of of uh that this emotion carries on is a lot longer than a, a normal or a neurotypical person who experiences these emotions i guess the 
I'll give you a really good example. Um, uh, now I'm, I'm thinking of a more of a, of like an excited, happy over like an overjoyed, good emotion that I felt in 2013. I was at a championship football game for my favorite team. Um, I'm in Canada, so I cheer for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in the Canadian Football League. And we were at the Grey Cup game in Regina, Saskatchewan. And they had just won the game. And I was having, I was going through a bit of a rough period at that time. And I was experiencing a lot of discomfort and I was having a lot of triggers and, and dealing with a lot of anxiety from personal issues like health related problems that I was experiencing for quite a while. And I really pushed myself through the week to try and overcome the, the, the problems that it was occurring in, mentally to try and enjoy the week. And I just remember going to the game and the difficulties that I had in not allowing the, the, the anxious, the anxiety and the struggles that I was dealing with affect my ability to enjoy the football game. And so when they won, I vividly remember it, it, it kind of feels like it was yesterday. A lot of times I remember standing at the, the bottom of the stairs, just at the railway and the team was celebrating their win. And I remember just soaking in all that, that, like that excitedness, like that, that feeling, that good feeling that you get. And it, it, it kind of, to me, it kind of felt like I, had been part of it. I know, of course, I wasn't, but I felt like I was part of the win as, as part of the team. And I remember standing there for the longest time and just kind of zoning out. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have the, the feelings that I was experiencing and all the problems throughout that week and earlier seemed to just be irrelevant. It disappeared and I, I just, I took in all the feelings that were there and it, the, like a normal person or sorry, I keep saying normal, a neurotypical person who would be there would stand there and cheer, you know, like they'd be screaming and yelling and, and cheering to, on their, their, the players, the team as they're getting the trophy. I was like standing there quiet and I could feel that that rise in me and that uh, that excited and, and that happy feeling and I couldn't it, it took a very long time excuse me it took me a very long time to get over that and it just wouldn't like it wasn't going away like not that I wanted it to go away of course but it just it was staying and it was continuing and going and going and I just I felt like I didn't want to go anywhere. It was so good and so enjoyable. It was like a distraction and it felt really good. And I was, ex I so, I, I always wish I could in, at, at times go back to that because it was one of the nicest and most incredible feelings that I had ever experienced being in person, watching my favorite football team win the championship in their stadium like at a home crowd right and just be having the the luck and the being fortunate enough to be there as part of the of the crowd in that game it just was so exciting and so incredible that it lasted a very 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 long time now back then I didn't really think anything of it, of course, because I didn't realize that I was I was suffering from uh, ADHD and CPTSD. But that was, it's I guess you could say it's a bit of an abnormal, um, extended feeling that I got, and it was I I didn't 
you know, I don't think I would go back and change. It's just that was just one of those things that was occurring because of ADHD. And the if you think about it on the opposite scale, like if you're sad or you're upset, it can occur in the same way. It will feel very overwhelming and it's very intense and it la- like it's not going to go away in five minutes, 10 minutes. It could literally last you an hour, a couple hours and you, the ability for your system to calm down and to move on from the like euphoric feeling is very difficult. And if it's a good feeling, nobody obviously would want that to end, but it's, it affects your ability to, um, like it with, it, it's, it kind of has that way with executive functioning because it, if, if you're not able to think about the present and, and properly and worry and think about what you're doing in the future, how your situation is with, with especially if you have other people around, it can affect them no matter if it is a happy feeling, excited feeling, or a, 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 a bad feeling, you know, you have anger or, or, or grief or something. So it, it, it does have the ability to affect you in that manner. It's one of those, it, it has the ability to really cause some major issues. So I'm just going to go on a little bit more here. Uh, people with ADHD have the same emotions as other people. So it's not like we have anything different or special or unique. The difference is that is that they often feel these emotions more intense. Like I said, the, the emotions also last longer and they can get in the way of everyday life. And because of that, people with ADHD can be overwhelmed with discouragement, frustration, anger. They give up too quickly on what they're doing and they avoid interacting with others. And some people have trouble putting the brakes on their feelings when they're angry or stressed. Others struggle to get revved up. So if if they're bored and they need to they want to get they want to do something or someone suggests an activity, they do struggle to get revved up to do that. And so they just kind of sit around and do nothing and then or as people will put it, be lazy all day. All right, everybody, I'm going to take a quick break. And then when I get back, I will continue on with emotional regulation with ADHD. All right, everybody, talk to you soon. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Russ with Living with ADHD and CPTSD, and again, I am talking about emotional regulation to do with ADHD, but in a way, it also does have to do with CPTSD, but we are discussing the ADHD side more so today. Okay, so the thing that we need to understand real quickly before I continue is the inability to be aware of the feeling, the fact that we're feeling, whether it's angry or happy or sad or disappointed or distraught or grieving about something is the, is be able to stop and reflect and move past the feeling. Now, I, I don't want you to, misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't mean that if you're feeling sad about something or you're feeling grief, like let's say somebody uh, in your family has died. Like I'm not saying that you need to get over it at a certain period of time. Like that's that's not necessarily the problem. Um, it's just that eventually, you know, like if we're so stuck in the feeling that it really can get in the way of living our life in a in our in a way that is productive and efficient and does not get us into trouble when it comes to dealing with normal situations that 
everybody typically deals with in a day or in a week. So we do need to be able to have a be doing a good job of recognizing that we're stuck in this emotion and we need to find a way to move on and to resolve that situation. Okay. So people with ADHD can be quick to get frustrated by minor annoyances. So whereas most people like here's a really good example. Um, when I drive and I'm going around, I do, I do drive for a living in my job. And so I see a lot of different things. I see bad drivers and good drivers, and I see really ridiculous situations that could potentially lead to a car accident, uh, or a pedestrian accident or people running a red light driving too slow. And I tend, I have a tendency to get upset about things that like someone driving too close to me or going too slow and I kind of start to get hot under the collar or start to get lose my cool and say things under my breath or out loud because I'm in the car so they can't hear me and it to a lot of other people it these things can be like a simple minor annoyance that they just go or they roll their eyes and they just, you know, they keep going and they move on where with me, these little tiny annoyances are not tiny annoyances. They are things that are going to get me to possibly lose my temper or say something that is childish, uh, rude, inconsiderate, uh, swearing, and it it's something that I can't necessarily see coming in the immediate future in the moment. It's it it occurs, and then you're just like, oh, right, oops, or 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 you realize later on how ridiculous and stupid that was that the thing you said, and especially if you have somebody else with you, they're gonna sh more often than not they're gonna surely say something to you and say that was really. Well, why did you say something so dumb? That was just such a small thing. <clears throat> um, but for someone with ADHD, it is definitely... And there's other examples out there, of course, but driving is definitely a, a, a good one to talk about because there is actually... I remember seeing on a Russell Barkley video on YouTube where he was discussing that majority of people who drive that are aggressive drivers and that have road rage are people who have ADHD. And obviously because the fact that we are ten we have a tendency to get frustrated easily by little tiny things that most people don't even don't even bat an eye at. And then of course another like as with ADHD because we have the fact that we have a tr we have trouble calming down when we are annoyed or angry it builds up so you know you're driving along and the first incident occurs and you start to feel that that anger build up and you're not at the level yet where you're going to start screaming or doing something that could get you into trouble or that you're going to regret just yet but it's there and it's at that it's at a level where it's close and the next thing occurs, and so your level keeps going up, and then it keeps going up, and all of a sudden you lose your top, and you start getting super angry, and you're yelling, and you're shaking your fist at them. You're some people, you know, could go even as far as like speeding to catch up to the person, tailgating them, pulling up beside them, and shaking their fist and showing your anger towards them and of course the person in the other car is going what the hell is going on what is this lunatic doing he's acting like a crazy nut and this is something that is a very common thing with people who have adhd and you know aggressive driving and and road rage is a very common thing with adhd sufferers so yeah we we have a hard time calming down from it and we easily get frustrated and angry at these things. So the other thing is, is we, along with that, because of it, we like feel wounded or take offense at even gentle criticism. So someone says something like, oh, that, 
you know, your, your plants a little dry. Like, let's say, you know, I have plants, so your plants a little dry. You need to water it a little bit more. A neurotypical would say something like, oh, you know, you're right. I, I guess I have been kind of not paying attention to the plants as much as I should. I've been a bit busy. I should go water it. Whereas someone with ADHD could very well take offense to that and get angry, right? So they're, they're obviously going to blow up and get angry at the person for even suggesting that the plant needs to be looked at. Like, how dare you, right? <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like a neurotypical person would look at that and, and think, what the hell is wrong with you? I was just saying that your plant just may need a bit of water. You know, I may know something about plants. And you're getting all upset because of a plant, you know, so it's really something that can get so out of control so fast. And now another thing that uh, Dr. Russell Barkley has mentioned in his videos, and I will give you a bit of a rundown at the end regarding Russell Barkley, that the one thing that tends to drive people or friends away from someone who has ADHD and prevents us from maintaining friendships and relationships and things, you know, is because of our emotions. We have such a hard time controlling our emotions, especially anger, that we drive away our friends and our girlfriends, our loved ones, because we're unable to control the ability to keep that anger under wrap. Or, to, or we end up saying something that we regret, right? So like basically highly volatile emotional trigger sensitivity and emotional impulsivity due to poor self-restraint. We have very, you know, we have a very lacking ability to restrain ourselves when we're feeling upset or angry. So of course we end up saying things. So it contributes to symptoms, right? Like impatience, low frustration tolerance, which is a very common thing with a, with most people who have ADHD. Quickness to get anger, reactive aggression, temper outbursts, and emotional liability. It's really difficult for someone with ADHD to maintain and control that and keep it in check. So, and the, the funny thing is, is working memory does work into this. Like I did talk about this in a previous episode last week uh, in executive function, but working memory is another function or executive function skill that we who suffer from ADHD struggle with, right? So, and they, we might be too focused on how we feel in the moment to keep their in mind of their other feelings. So if we're feeling angry and say something harsh, even though they really don't want to upset anybody it's something that is difficult to control so you're gonna you're gonna drive away somebody because you're so angry that you're unaware of other things that you're doing so you don't even you may not even realize that you've said something mean or rude and you can't exactly just take that back once it's out it's out right you can't go back in time and stop yourself and well, that's where the impulse problem comes in, right? We have a hard time being or maintaining our impulse drive, and we have a lack of ability to control the inhibition. So we're easily triggered to get to say something mean or, or angry, and then we end up driving people away because we can't stop ourselves. Whether it's even if we get angry, we can't stop ourselves from saying something that we'll regret later. <clears throat> Okay, so pro like self-regulating is our primary emotional response. So we have a problem with it, right? So individuals with ADHD can experience such intense and overwhelming primary emotional reactions that we often find it difficult to inhibit the expression of this emotion or to moderate the emotions and replace it with a secondary emotional reaction. So... We also have, of course, problems refocusing their attention away from the strong emotion. So we be, it's like a, it's like we're hyper focused on that emotion, and we can't step back, even if it's for a few a second or two, to realize what we're doing. 
and say, okay, hold on, need to calm down, need to just realize what this is potentially doing and affecting our relationship or our friendship here, especially if you're getting angry at one of your friends for something that's overblown. You don't realize that, of course. So we're not capable of, of holding our tongue or stopping ourselves from saying the thing that's going to drive them out of the, you know, they're going to leave and say, screw you, buddy. You're not, you're just not worth it. You're crazy or you just, you're out of control. So, and uh, so, yeah, like the inability to refocus attention away from strong emotions can definitely make it difficult to reduce or moderate the primary emotional response. Refocusing problems will also contribute to thought rumination. And the difficulty self-soothing in order to moderate their primary emotional response is due to poor working memory, the reduced ability to use self-speech and visual imagery. And then difficulties organizing an executive and appropriate secondary response due to difficulties of praising uh, flexibility man manipulation and organizing information, generating and appraising alternative responses and their and then understanding their possible outcomes is difficult. And then you are having a hard time planning the appropriate response in the moment. So we're so quick on the draw, as I guess you want to put it, and impulsive that we don't have the ability to, before we say it, the, the, the thing that is going to be the ultimate, like the really terrible thing you say to your, your friends or to a loved one, we don't have the ability to stop and think about what we're going to say and our minds to create the correct response that's going to avoid having that, you know, having you lose that friend due to something that you, you'll say that you're going to regret. We don't realize in the moment that what we're going to say is really bad and is regrettable. That's one of those, that's the problem here is that because we can't, we have such poor emotional regulation, we drive people away. And I'm sure a lot of you, whether you are willing to admit it or not, have probably experienced this a number of times with former friends of yours, where something that they've done, and more often than not, are probably complete innocent or misunderstandings, you have had an outburst and a temper tantrum where you've said something. And once you've calmed down and you realize, oh, damn, what I said was was hurtful and I should never have said that and I'm sorry, there you might be lucky enough for the friend to go, well, I understand. It's okay. Apology accepted. You know, we'll just have to be, just be careful. But the thing is, is if you do it a second time and if you're, you know, most people aren't lucky enough to, to get a third chance. If you do it a second time, there's a, you know, 99% chance you're probably going to lose that friend for life because they're just going to think you're crazy or that you just don't have any ability to think about other people and only about yourself. Like you're, you're conceited or you're selfish and you're just mean. That's what they're going to think. They're not going to realize, or they may not even care that it is an ADHD problem that you're dealing with. So it's very difficult. And if, if you don't realize these things, or if you're really, uh, if you're not aware of it, and we don't exactly have good self-awareness to begin with, it's extremely difficult to control and to prevent these sort of outbursts and regrettable comments that you may say from even occurring. So you got to be, you know, we got to be careful about that. Okay, everybody, I'm going to take a quick short break here and then we'll get back and wrap this episode up. Okay. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon. everybody welcome back living with ADHD and CPTSD we are in the episode with emotional regulation issues so 
This next area that I'm going to talk about, I do have a lot of experience with. So this is going to be a good section of this episode here. So I will get on it right away here, okay? So individuals with ADHD are more likely to experience and display emotions that are more intense, particularly during interpersonal interactions, uh, possibly being due to overwhel being overwhelmed by the emotion. We are more likely to become overly excited, uh, focus on more negative aspects of a task or a situation, express frustration or anger, and become verbally or physically aggressive. We are more likely to experience problems in social relationships, including social rejection, bullying in school or in work, and isolation. And then are also more likely to experience relationship and marital problems and relationship breakups and divorces. We have difficulties achieving work or academic goals and requirements, receiving a school suspension or expulsion or losing their job or failing to be promoted are a lot more likely to occur. We are also more likely to be involved in road rage, like a road rage, like I said earlier, and car accidents. And we also we have report of increased psychological distress from their emotional experiences. We develop are more likely to develop anxiety and or depression and have conduct problems like meaning that we're more likely to be involved in crime and be institutionalized. So these sort of things are definitely good possibilities for someone who struggles to deal with their emotional regulation issues. It, there is an actual study that has shown that people who have ADHD have a shorter lifespan because of what I have just discussed about, especially things like car accidents, crime, uh, like getting involved in crime. You're because of the fact that you don't have the ability to realize in the moment, like if you're speeding or you're drinking and driving or you're doing drugs and trying to drive or you're getting involved in criminal activities, which obviously, of course, are very dangerous and risky to your health and to your life. We don't have the ability to, in the moment, think about our actions and what the consequences are going to be. So we're more likely to get out there and do these things without realizing what are the potential, you know, things that are going to occur because of our actions. And it is very frightening and very scary for a lot of us because the potential for this to occur is so much higher, obviously, that, and, and also because we have such a difficult time controlling that. We get out there and we have these impulses that we want to do something and we aren't able to, to see in our minds or have our, our inner voice, I guess you could say, tell us, this is not a good idea. We shouldn't be doing this. This is something that's going to get us into trouble or get us hurt or killed. And we get out there and it happens. And if you survive or, you know, maybe you wreck your car and you get, you know, you don't have a car anymore, so you can't go into your job. Or maybe your insurance rates go sky high because you're deemed to be a higher threat to get into another accident. Or if you like to speed, like a lot of people with ADHD are tend to speed a lot more and not just a few kilometers over the limit. We're talking like 10, 20, even 30 or more kilometers over the speed limit. We're really susceptible to dangerous activities and the consequences of these activities. It's not a good thing. I'm, I do feel pretty fortunate that my abilities to control this is a lot better than some people. And it is unfortunate that not everybody has that fortunate, uh, fortunality to be that way. I don't speed uh, when I drive. Like I do go a few kilometers over the speed limit when I'm on the highway, but in the city, and when I'm just kind of driving around neighborhoods, I'm trying my best to be very aware of the speed limits and to stay at that speed limit. And But I'm not exactly what you would call the 
safest, best driver in the world. I am willing and most and happily willing to admit that that is the truth. And the reason is, is because the fact that we are, we are not as aware of our actions and our strengths or our weaknesses as we like to believe. There has been tests and studies done where, and this, again, this Dr. Russell Barkley has done a study where he talked to and evaluated a large number of people who drive and have ADHD. And they, the drivers would say that they claim that they're good drivers, that they have a clean record, they don't get into accidents. You know, they, they're, they're saying in their experience that they think that they're safe drivers. And then they go look at their driving records or they talk to their friends or, you know, someone else who drives with them a lot. And it turns out that they're really not safe drivers at all. As a matter of fact, they're really bad drivers. We are not very good at being aware of our own abilities. We think that we're doing pretty good or that we're capable, but in reality, well, our ability of, for self-awareness is really poor compared to a neurotypical person. So it's just one of those things that unfortunately is the God's honest truth when it comes to ADHD. And it is, it is an unfortunate side effect of it because we are in danger a lot more frequently than others. And just one of those things, unfortunately. And uh, it, all the, like all the things that we could, excuse me, all the things that we can do to help reduce the symptoms, like a proper diet, exercise, sleep, taking um, extra vitamins, additives, uh, doing the medic, the, the ADHD medication all can help reduce these sort of symptoms, but it's never going to be a perfect cure, unfortunately. So speaking of improving, how to improve emotional regulation skills. This is a big one. It's, this is, I would definitely keep this in mind. Um, I hope this is something that will be helpful for you. Okay. So how to improve emotional regulation skills. There's quite a few. There are, oh, I th well, I'm here. Just sorry. I'm just taking a quick look at my notes. I forgot. Good old ADHD. There's five basic ones and there's a bit of a you know explanation for each i'll try to be brief i understand that it's difficult for us to focus on things for a great deal of time by the way just to let you know if you ever feel like you need to take a break by all means pause take a break go take a 10 minute break and and read Recharge those those batteries. Recharge that mind. Get some water. Maybe go for a quick walk. You know, distract yourself. Try to regroup and then come back and listen. You know, it obviously it's all the same to me, of course, because this is a recording. You know, trying to be funny. Okay, so first one. Focusing on prevention. Preventative techniques help by decreasing vulnerability to strong emotions. The best way to modulate a strong emotion is to prevent the emotional experience from being overwhelming. And the following areas will help prevent help to prevent strong emotional responses. Slow down and name your emotions. There's a Dr. Sharon Celine out there who recommends that these techniques to interrupt heightened emotions. Identify your bodily signs, shortness of breath, increased heart rate, louder voice, and perspiration indicate that you are being triggered. Create a plan for what to do to sense yourself and pause. Go to the bathroom and wash your hands or face. Step outside for fresh air. Listen to some music. All right, now, treating physical illness. Routine illnesses like colds, flu, and pain can make us vulnerable to increased emotional volatility. Appropriate treatments of these conditions are vital. Take medication and vitamin supplements as prescribed, like I said earlier, and schedule an appointment with your medical doctor if you do not feel well. Eat well. Eating regularly with a focus on, with a focus on nutrition will improve your body's ability to regulate itself. 
Eating every few hours will serve to keep your blood sugar and energy stable. You should focus on eating a balanced meal with a focus on ensuring that you're eating enough fruits and vegetables. That's very true. I remember in the past, I would, I didn't exactly eat healthy. Um, I know none of you have really seen too many photos of me. My website does have a photo of me um, standing with my girlfriend at a place called Drum Heller, Alberta. Um, but that's the only one. I Back, oh geez, three, three years ago now, about three and a half, I used to be a, um, a whopping 242 pounds. I was overweight. I was not healthy. I was eating a lot of bad foods. I was going to Tim Hortons, a local coffee shop, and buying like a donut. I wasn't. I definitely wasn't eating healthy, and I was eating too much. And on top of it, I wasn't really exercising a lot. It was not good. I remember getting a scare from my doctor, and it really woke me up, and it forced me to change my diet. So about, oh, let's see, six, seven months later, I was down to 192 pounds. I lost 50 pounds because I decided to eat healthy. And I ate a lot more fruits and vegetables. I cut down on junk food. I stopped drinking pop. And to be honest, I hardly ever touch them. I think I've maybe had one pop in the last two or three months. And it was, and even then it was a small one. I don't even exactly have a lot. If I ever do get food from a fast food place, which isn't very often at all, I get a water bottle instead of a pop. Pop's just bad for you. Honestly, just avoid pop. Try to avoid fast food. I realize that it's not easy to cook, especially if you're working a lot or you have a busy life, especially if you've got a family. But eating healthy is a really big deal when it comes to helping battle this ADHD. Uh, along with that, um, avoiding uh, portions that are too large can lead to physical discomfort due to overeating, of course. And they do say you should avoid or limit foods in high in sugar, fat, and caffeine. So unfortunately, uh, for people who do drink coffee, it is something that you honestly could try to avoid because caffeine definitely does make ADHD a lot worse. It ain't going to make it better, that's for sure. So that goes along with soft drinks, or as we call it up in Canada, pop, Coca-Cola, you know, Pepsi. That's not good. Um, any sort of caffeine. And, and those those energy drinks, those are just a bad, that's just a no if you have ADHD and you're drinking an energy drink, it doesn't surprise me that you're having really bad problems with ADHD and irritability, emotional problems, impulse drive problems. You got to cut those out. I get it's difficult, but you're going to benefit from it. And you'll thank me if you actually do stop drinking them. All right, continuing. Avoid mood-altering drugs and substances. Uh, only take medications that are prescribed by a doctor. Uh, drinking alcohol only in moderation, and preferably one drink on weekends or on days off, and only in moderation on those days. And avoid illegal substances and non-prescribed medications. Well, honestly, that's a no-brainer. Just doing drugs is just not smart. You know, I don't think I have to tell you that. Anybody out there can tell you that doing drugs is not a good idea. Using drugs and alcohol, it does increase susceptibility and vulnerability to strong emotions. And then the vulnerability persists for one to two days following the use. Getting good sleep is important. Most people do need 10 to 8 to 10 hours of sleep per night. And practicing good sleep hygiene by unplugging from electronic devices at least an hour before bed and going to sleep at the same time every night and turning the light off completely at least 15 minutes before you would like to be asleep. Avoid naps. I, I know it's difficult. Um, I'm not exactly someone who sleeps consistently well. Uh, there are times where I do wake up a few times during the night, and I tend to wake up before my alarm even goes off. So I have a hard time sleeping. I, I can fall asleep easily, but it's maintaining the sleep. 
So they do say to avoid naps during the day, and it does improve your quality of sleep if you don't nap. And if you do, they say limit it to 30, to, sorry, 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, the big one that I think is really beneficial is the exercise. Um, your spirit and mind does play a role in emotional regulation and ADHD, and so does your body. A review of research on ADHD has found that exercise can reduce symptoms of ADHD in adults. Exercise improves executive functioning and emotional regulation. Cardio exercise is particularly effective and the non-cardio exercise, so like lifting weights, has also some effect. Do one thing each day to obtain a sense of mastery. Feeling like you have mastered something gives you a sense of accomplishment, capability, and confidence. That is big. Master tasks may be completion of daily responsibilities, such as household cleaning, learning a new task, or enhancing a mastery in a task that you already know. This is good. It is also actually a known thing that you can get a dopamine hit from this. If you're doing something that you enjoy and you really like, you have an, a much easier time, as, as you're probably well aware of, of focusing on that task to completion. So when you are doing it, like I, I have a few things I like to do. Obviously, I like to do my podcast. I love to draw. I have taken lessons a number of times. I also love photography. I love some cooking. I love things like learning about history. Uh, I like music. I like um, animals. I love dogs, cats, right? Like when I'm doing these kind of things, like I'm learning about this stuff or I'm doing a drawing, uh, I take some, f I take photos and I think they're really good and I get compliments on these photos from people that I know. It makes me feel good. It really makes me feel like um, like I'm doing something good and I'm learning and I'm getting better and I'm mastering this. So it really helps increase my level of self-confidence. And it helps with this because of the fact that it, if you're not feeling very confident in yourself, there's a much better chance that you're going to have the sim your ADHD symptoms affect your ability to have a normal day. Okay, coping ahead when possible. It simply means planning for events that you know will trigger a strong emotional response. Identify the type of situations that typically evoke a strong reaction for you and identify what you need to feel more in control and prepared for the situation. Then just follow through with what works. Preparation techniques may take form of role play to prepare for a difficult situation carrying an item to remind you of your coping strategies and using your self-soothing skills in the moments before this event is to occur. Don't be discouraged and give up if the initial coping attempts are not successful. Sometimes it can take trial and error to find a plan that works. And just remember, practicing your, your strategies routinely, even when you're calm, are easier to help because when you are upset and when you are having these problems, it's a lot harder to correct the issue and practice the skill. There's a little bit of a quote, just like a basketball team does not learn a new play during a game, plays are learned and practiced beforehand. So put that into effect. Coping skills work the same way. Be mindful by being present in the moment. It is not an uncommon experience during times of emotional upset that your thoughts begin to spiral, reminding you of previous times when similar situations have occurred and have not gone well. This creates more anxiety and increases the risk of failure in the present situation. Keep your focus on your current situation. Plan for your dealings with strong emotions. It's a, this is important because if you're being mindful, you know, like it, it helps you better prepare for this. If, if you're not being mindful, if you're like oblivious in your own world and a symptom occurs or you get emotionally upset, you're less likely to be able to recover quickly. You, you may end up taking a long, very long time to recover at all. So mindfulness practice. Recent studies do suggest that mindfulness may help symptoms of ADHD in adults and you might want to try you could try one of one or all of these three meditative techniques you can do a body scan sitting meditation or you can do mindful yoga 
Mindfulness does bring you back to the present moment through awareness of the body. The awareness can give you the pause you need to redirect strong emotions. Like I said, because of ADHD, we have a very difficult time thinking before we act or speak. If we can get better at seeing this ahead, then we can redirect that emotion or those thoughts and avoid the consequences that come from it. You can also develop emotional awareness and you can enjoy mindfulness practices through, well, churches, community centers, you can go online. There are many apps that do allow you to practice mindfulness in your own home. Okay, listen to your thoughts and learn from them. A comparative research study trusted source found that people with ADHD often unconsciously engage in the following types of thinking. Self-blame. It's all my fault. Blaming others. If I only had done that. Catastrophizing. This is the worst day ever. And rumination. If only. What if? If only. What if? If you're experiencing negative emotions, you could try writing down your thoughts. It may take some work, but you might consider reframing repeated negative thoughts. So here's some examples. I did one part well. Maybe they had good reasons for their actions. This morning was rough, but the day is getting better. I'll let it go for now. Tomorrow is another day. And then the one that I've talked about many times, a lot of it in CPTSD episodes, use grounding techniques. Now, before I go into this, it, I, if you've been listening to me before, you're very aware of these. If you are new to the program, I will go quickly over these, okay? But I do recommend checking out some of my past episodes. Now, I recently understood and I learned that grounding techniques or, or coping techniques a lot of times will work for multiple disabilities. Just, you know, just because you use grounding techniques for being triggered and having and being blended with your child parts doesn't mean that you can't use these things for ADHD related issues as well. If you're feeling emotionally heightened and you're feeling angry and there's a possibility that you could lash out at someone and get into trouble or say something you regret, you could definitely use the grounding techniques. So I'm going to, this is, this is a work off of one of my techniques, the five senses technique. This is called the five, four, three, two, one game. So if you find yourself beginning to lose focus, ground yourself in the moment. In this technique, the 54321 game, you ground yourself in a physical environment by naming five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can feel against your skin, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. If you're not eating or you're driving in your car, it is difficult to do the tasting one, unless you've got a drink. That works. If it feels, if it does feel too complicated, just remember to ground yourself in your current environment using the five senses. There, see? A more simplistic grounding technique would be to count the number of different colors you can see in your environment. That's actually a big one. I remember going to therapy and my therapist would do that one. He would always ask me to find and tell me five things in the room that are the color blue, right? And I've gone over this in past episodes. It's actually, it's very soothing. It does actually help you ground because it, it forces you to separate and to think. And I, I know that thinking with ADHD is difficult, but if with practice, you can become really good at it. All uh, right, number four, we're getting near the end, folks. Identify negative patterns of thinking. Be mindful of be, by being aware of unrealistic or negative patterns of thinking that lead to strong emotional reactions. Negative and distorted thinking comes in many different forms and leads to strong emotional responses that are based on your automatic misinterpretations of the situation. The following that I'm going to read to you are some of the most common types of negative thoughts. One, all or nothing thinking. This is a type of thinking where you see only the extremes. Something is awful or wonderful. People love you or hate you. 
This type of thinking sees the world in black and white while ignoring the entire gray in between. This is this is so true. It's amazing, you know. I've had to deal with this many, many times, and I and I know it happens. It's it's very subconscious. You don't even know necessarily that it's occurring. It's one of those things that has gotten me into trouble a number of times with my girlfriend, unfortunately. So <clears throat> you just it's difficult to stop too, and I understand. All right, two. Over generalization. This type of thinking makes assumptions that something is true based upon one or two previous experiences. For instance, you may think that you are a failure because you received unsatisfactory feedback from your boss on one assignment. Jeez, that's pretty rough. Three, mental filter. This type of thinking refers to filtering out all the positive experiences and focusing only on negative experiences. For example, you give a presentation at work and get tongue-tied at one part. So you may end up fixating only on that one part rather than the overall presentation, which was just fine. I had that problem. I know that I, I and I have, tend to, have a tendency to think this and even say it. I could have a great day, like a couple good days. Things are good, not having any triggers, very minimal symptoms for my ADHD. And then I have one day that goes wrong it doesn't it doesn't it's not working i seem to always having problems all day long getting in nothing but arguments and disagreements and getting triggered over and over and i focus solely on all that negative experiences that i've felt throughout that day and i completely fail to remember that i've made improvements the difference that I was compared to a year ago or six months ago is so much better. I don't. I can't think about it. And I never remember it. I I literally had to be reminded about the fact that there are a lot of good experiences from my past that have helped me improve. And once I'm able to, you know, reflect and think about it for a little while, I realize that, yeah, she's absolutely right. I have had a lot of good experiences and I've made a lot of improvements over the time. So it's just because I've had a bad day doesn't mean it's the end of the world. That's actually a very famous thing or, you know, something that is a quote that she always says to me that it's not the end of the world just because this happened. And it does make you step back and think and reflect on stuff. All right, four. I do this one. Oh, geez. Mind reading. This type of thinking refers to assuming that you know what someone else is thinking or know why they do a particular action. For instance, you may assume that someone does not respond to your question because they are ignoring you or because they do not care about you or your feelings. We never truly know what someone else is thinking or why they act the way they yeah, why they act the way they act. By assuming you do know, you are more likely to misinterpret their actions and react by becoming frustrated, angry, and overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm laughing because I th I can remember, oh, a few handful of times that I've done this. I, th I interrupt and I think I know what they're thinking. And so I interrupt them and I'm not allowing them to finish their, finishing their conversation. And she gets upset because I'm doing this. Oh, I, I, I think I know what you're going to say. So instead of allowing her to finish, I am finishing my sentence or, or sorry, her sentence. And that is actually a common symptom in ADHD is that we tend to do a lot of interrupting and trying to finish people's sentences. So that does play into the mind reading thing. That's it, it's very frustrating because we do it so impulsively. It is difficult to control, honestly. Okay, number five, emotional reasoning. This type of thinking refers to the belief that what you feel is true. I feel like a failure, so that means I am a failure. <sighs> uh, number six, catastrophizing. This refers to the belief that the worst case scenario... <laughs> oh, geez. Sorry, I'm just... I'm thinking about my own experiences. Oh, my God. Sorry, 
the belief that the worst case scenario is going to happen or that the most extreme interpretation of the situation is the truth. For example, if you do poorly on a work project, you may assume that you are a terrible employee, that you will be fired and never find employment again. This leads to strong reactions of stress and defensiveness due to a belief that you need to defend yourself against this terrible outcome. What to do if you're experiencing negative thoughts? There are many other types of negative thinking that leads to strong emotions. A good rule is if you feel a strong emotional reaction, stop and identify what you are thinking. Then ask yourself if your belief is supported by that situation. If not, mentally tell yourself all of the evidence that you see and know that proves that your thoughts are not based in reality. Then identify a more balanced thought. For example, if you believe that you're going to be fired because you were not successful in a, on a single work assignment, you may tell yourself that while you made a mistake on this assignment, you did well on all the other assignments and expectations that you have been given and that your bosses compliments you frequently on your good work. The more balanced thought would be, while I made a mistake, I'm not likely to get fired for one mistake. So yeah, catastrophizing. I tell you, I have done that. I, I've done it so often, I don't remember. the. I can't even remember details. All I know is that, and you could ask one of my friends. I have a friend, Julia. She's the one that always points it out, that I always am a worst scenario, worst case scenario kind of person. If something goes wrong or is going to go wrong, it's going to be the end of the world. It's going to be the worst possible thing that could ever occur in my life. When in the reality is that it's not so bad. It's not that hard. I do it so much. I, I literally get triggered over it because every time something seems that has the potential to go wrong, I think it's going to go wrong in the worst possible way. That's, I know it sounds a little crazy, but it is true. It's something that a lot of us do. And it's very difficult. Like thinking about negative thoughts is so common for us because we experience externally so many negative experiences, you know, bullying, being made fun of, always being told that we're not good enough, that there's something wrong with us. You know, it, it, it adds up and we start to believe it. It's kind of like um, the, what's the, I can't think of Stockholm syndrome. There we go. Where you've been kidnapped for so long that you start to fall in love with your kidnapper. It's sort of similar, but it's it's the same idea. You start to believe what people are telling you because it's all you ever hear. All right. I'm going to take one last break. And then when I get back, we're going to finish up this episode. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon. Welcome back, everybody. All right, this is the final segment of today's episode. And we're going to wrap up talking about practicing good self-soothing techniques. This is important, so obviously leave it to the end. It is important that you learn and implement ways to calm your physical and emotional responses in difficult situations. When you recognize that your emotions are becoming overwhelming, Separate yourself from the triggered situ triggering situations to de-escalate de yourself. The following are some suggestions for techniques that some people find beneficial. First one is diaphragmatic breathing. Take a deep breath through your nose and allow it to fill your lungs, causing your diaphragm to rise. Then breathe out slowly. They say if you put your hands on your stomach, you should be able to, to see them rise if you are complete, correctly breathing. Using either a square or a triangle breathing approach is also helpful. Square breathing involves breathing in for four seconds, holding for four seconds, breathing out for four seconds, and then wait for four seconds before repeating this step. Triangle breathing is the same minus the final step of waiting. So breathe in, hold, 
breathe out, and then immediately repeat. I've actually had my therapist talk about this with me. And I'll, you know, honestly, it works. Just trust me on this. I've done it a number of times. I've gotten a little, you know, excited and heightened while in therapy talking about my issues. And he has interrupted in the middle of it and has gotten me to do some breathing. So, you know, you breathe in and you do your, you, you do this, this, the square breathing is actually really good. So, you know, you breathe in. Yeah, and then repeat. So that is very helpful. It does calm you down. It does allow you to try and step back and see the alternate ways of doing, you know, dealing with the emotions, dealing with the stress and the anger. It is very helpful. All right, the next one that they say is progressive muscle relaxation. This involves systematically tightening and relaxing your muscles beginning at your feet and continuing until you've reached the top of your head. And then you continue this activity until your body feels relaxed. Now, here's the thing. This is something that I have been looking at and I'm going to read it out to you. ADHD is a disorder of performance, not of skill or knowledge. Notice that I didn't say you need to learn more about self-regulation self and executive functioning. You already get it. For example, you know the principle behind strategies like the STOP method or similar ones to help you manage your emotions in the moment. You know you should stop when you realize you're about to get hijacked by your reaction. Take a breath. Observe what is going on in your body and not just your head. Proceed once you've done all this. Yet, you don't use the strategies you know despite the consequences. And you repeat it, repeatedly say to yourself, I know what I need to do, I just need to do it. But if you could just do it, don't you think you would have done it by now? Why would you continue to say or do things you later regret if you could stop doing it? You wouldn't. The reality is that, like most ADHD adults, you don't need to learn the mechanics of, of a method like STOP. You already know and have tried plenty of suggested strategies you found in books and on websites, but they just don't stick. And there's a good reason for that. Your challenge with ADHD is primarily one of performance rather than a lack of skills or knowledge. That is, at the critical moment of choice, you are not able to do what you know you need to do to reach your goals. Sure, you could probably learn a few more helpful strategies, but that won't be enough. You need to re-engineer your environment to help you do what you know and what you don't want to do when you want to do it. Remembering to remember, externalizing cues at point of performance. To be able to remember the plan and close the gap between skills, knowledge, and performance, you'll first need to externalize the cues. Externalizing motivation to support performance. Remembering the plan might not be enough to help you follow through, though. After all, how many times have you defaulted to old patterns, despite knowing better? Of course, there might be other factors, but a contributing element might be your inability to tap into your motivation reward in the moment you are choosing whether to act or perform. Similar to externalizing cues, the antidote to this conundrum might be to externalize your motivation. So you remember in the moment of choice why you would choose to follow the plan. So it just basically is trying to say that in order to help, you know, make your symptoms and the problems that, are come, that occur from ADHD, you have to find ways to externalize. That means externalizing motiv motivation, sorry, motivation, excuse me. Using things like reminders, um, external notes, uh, people helping you with reminders, phone reminders, pictures, stuff, stuff that will verb like visually show you and assist you in, in doing these things. Trying to rely on your memory and trying to rely on 
your natural ability is not necessarily going to be enough, especially if you're heightened and you're feeling really emotionally strong and not your normal self. You do have to take care of that. And a lot of people just need to understand that there's nothing wrong with an external reminder or an external motivation to help you with your performance. It is a difficult thing to do, but it's very helpful. All right, everybody. Now, before I go, I do want to make a nice announcement. Uh, it'll be great for a lot of you. In the next coming time, or probably the next month, I am going to be expanding my shows onto YouTube. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, as I am recording my podcast, to go on to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your, where you're listening to this. I am also going to record an audio, uh, sorry, a video version of my recording. I'm just in the middle of the setting it up and making sure everything is set as prepared and I've got my background and the little intro done up, but I'm basically going to do a video version of my podcast and you'll get to see me and I will also, well, what it allows me to do is to potentially have interviews with other ADHD people who suffer from this disability on my show and the ability to go on to their shows. I have reached out and there are a few people that I am working with to cr do some cross work with to get some more information and another mind uh, and experiences they have with ADHD onto the show. And one thing I am going to do, because I have noticed that a large portion of my audience happens to be female, I am going to be doing an episode about females with ADHD, women and ADHD. There are a lot of differences between men and women that come to or come with ADHD. And I would like to reach out to my female audience and show them what ADHD is like in women. I think that'll be a really good episode. Uh, I am hoping to perhaps get an interview uh, with someone who is obviously a woman and has ADHD and get their side of the uh, of the tale <laughs> or their perspective on what is like living with ADHD on a daily basis. All right, everyone. Great episode today. I know it's a bit long, but there was a lot of information to go over regarding emotional regulation. Tomorrow will be a CPTSD episode and it should be a really good one. Uh, I still haven't decided actually what it's going to be yet. It was something that I was going to do next, or sorry, last week, but something came up, as, a, as you all know. All right. Okay, everybody, have a great day. And for many of you, I will hear you tomorrow. All right, everyone. Take care.